Gamba Malgan Gamba Nani Guinea Du, which is good evening. Um, it's good to see you um, here, in, which is in Baragam, the language of the community that I grew up on, the Darling Downs. And good evening, everyone, and it's fantastic to have you joining us this evening. My name is Vicky McDonald, and it is my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to State Library for our first Portrait of an Artist event for 2023. But let me begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We're inspired by that tradition here at State Library in the work that we do to share and preserve Queensland's memories for future generations. I'd also like to welcome um, particularly our speakers for tonight's event, Leonard Brown and also Julie Ewington, who, and Julie is the curator of our current exhibition, Meet the Artists. I also welcome James Souris and his sister Marika as well. Fantastic to have you here. And they have um, been long-term generous and visionary supporters of State Library of Queensland. I also welcome Debbie Best, the Chair of the Library Board of Queensland, Dr Jodie Saganto, a member of the Library Board, uh, Helen Brody, President of the Queensland Library Foundation, and Helen Barnard, a member of the Foundation Council as well. And I also welcome Chris Sainz. There, uh, Chris, there. It's, it's terrible when you're up here. I can't see anything. It's just all black. So, but anyway, thankfully everyone has sat in the front two rows. So, and it's fantastic to have Chris here, uh, a colleague, um, and uh, of course, director of the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. So tonight we're here to discuss the extraordinary life and career of acclaimed Queensland artist and James C. Sewer's collection of artists interview, Leonard Brown. Born in Brisbane in 1949, Leonard's first art teacher was Miss Cameron, who later became the renowned Betty Churcher, director of the National Gallery of Australia. So Leonard started formal study at Brisbane Central Technical College Art School in 1965. And it was then that tutor and artist Roy Churcher told him, there was talk on the grapevine that painting is dead. The death of painting would become a recurring refrain in the ensuing decades, but fortunately, Leonard kept his faith and in himself as a professional artist and in the future of painting. His first solo exhibition at the age of 19 was reviewed and, and praised by another doyen of the Brisbane <laughs> Art... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, we do do our research here, Leonard. <laughs> um, so his first solo exhibition was at the age of 19 and it was reviewed and praised by another doyen of the Brisbane art world, Dr Gertrude Langer. So faith and spirituality came to be the cornerstone of Leonard's life and art. When he finished school in 1969, so we're giving everything away tonight, <laughs> he put his artistic development on hold to develop other aspects of his life. He was accepted as a novice at the Anglican Franciscan community of Brookfield on the outskirts of Brisbane. At the friary, Leonard encountered the Russian Orthodox Bishop of Brisbane, Bishop Constantine, who was a master of Byzantine icon painting. And in 1975, Leonard began studying and practicing under his direction and was baptized Russian Orthodox the following year. He maintained his minimalist abstract art practice while also painting icons in the Byzantine tradition. During his mid-career period, Leonard was almost living two different lives, yet they were deeply linked. He also travelled widely and lectured in art history and practice during this time. Leonard has won many accolades throughout his career, including becoming a three times finalist in the Sulman Prize at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, being awarded the Blake Prize for Religious Art and winning the inaugural Brisbane Portrait Prize in 2019. And I believe we have the judge here as well. Some 55 years since that first solo exhibition, the distinct yet connected aspects, aspects of Leonard's art practice, dazzling icons, pulsating abstracts and evocative portraits continue to inform one another. His faith in the ongoing tradition of painting remains strong and as he says, painting is one of the few areas of cultural continuity. Tonight, Leonard will be in conversation with writer, curator, broadcaster, and Australian art expert, Julie Ewington. Julie led the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Arts, Australian Art Department for many years, and has a deep understanding of Australian art and artists. 
And it's been an absolute privilege to work with Julie over the last 12 months or so, I guess. Our team has really enjoyed the opportunity to work with Julie while she's been curating the Meet the Artists exhibition here at the State Library of Queensland. And that exhibition, of course, is for the people of Queensland to enjoy. The exhibition features all the artists from the James C. Suris collection of artists' interviews, telling their stories in their own words, and highlights the practice of eight outstanding Queensland artists. I encourage you, everyone, to participate in the conversation tonight by sending your questions via Slido for the question and answer session that will be at the end of tonight's conversation. And you can see the, um, the QR code on the screen behind me. If you click on that, it'll take you through to the screen to ask the questions. And Slido is a very democratic uh, process. You can vote for questions and they go to the top. So um, do take that opportunity. This is our first Portrait of an Artist event presented in tandem with the Meet the Artists exhibition. And this series and exhibition would not have been possible without the visionary support of James and his sister Marika. Through their generosity, the library holds an incredible documentary record and history of artists and art world figures connected to Queensland. With the Meet the Artists exhibition, we've been able to expand on the films and celebrate the ongoing work of some of the most remarkable contemporary Australian artists. The collection of artists' interviews is accessible at any time online via our website. Whether for research or for enjoyment, it exemplifies the library's vision of inspiring and connecting people through knowledge, stories and creativity. Finally, a couple of other opportunities that I'd like to mention to you. So following tonight's discussion, the library shop will have the Meet the Artist catalogue, which was authored by Julie. And, and also merchandise available for purchase. So you would have noticed the table just outside the auditorium door. And we've also arranged for the Meet the Artists exhibition in the SLQ gallery, uh, which you would have passed as you arrived, and it'll be open this evening as well so that you have the opportunity to visit the exhibition tonight as well. But for now, please enjoy Leonard's digital story, which was recorded in 2015, and following the, that recording, uh, he will be in conversation with Julie. So enjoy. Thank you. In your childhood, your first exposure to works of art was within a spiritual context, in, in the context of the church. Yeah. I wonder, what was, what was your earliest experiences of a, a more secular kind of artwork? Did you see exhibitions at the Queensland Art Gallery? My brother, nine, who's nine years older than me, um, would... Um, I, I would quite often hang out with him in the movies in Fortitude Valley, um, where we, um, in 1955, I think we saw Robinson Crusoe, um, and that made a very marked impression on me. But then um, my brother also took me to the Queensland Art Gallery, the National Gallery of Queensland. And the museum at that time had amazing Well, everything, everything was out. Yeah. Everything was out. It wasn't a, a curator's selection. Mm -hmm. uh, all the great cases of bird's eggs, and it, it, it was just a labyrinth of, um, of things to look at. But then we went. The first time I remember walking into the Queensland Art Gallery, uh, and I didn't know what they were at the time, but the show, it would seem, was the Travelling Turner show from, uh, from London. Um, what year was that, do you uh, think? I, I think it was 1960. Mm -hmm. And they, because it was a travelling show, the works, for the most part, were small. And they were very... They had the appearance of being very fragile. Um, and... But very intense. And so... You, in 1968, have your first solo exhibition mm. at the age of 19. I lied about my age. Right. Because I thought they wouldn't take me seriously. Or serve you wine, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, no, I, 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 I told them I was not quite 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was worried that they may not take me seriously. Um, and did they? Yes, they did. Mm. Yeah, the, um, the exhibition attracted reviews by Dr. Gertrude Langer. Um, she spoke about my cool, quiet, uh, white moods. 
that were not erotic. Um, it was very strange that she saw them as unerotic. I don't, I'm not quite sure about them. Up until this point, things had been set. Yet your next solo exhibition isn't until the early 1980s. Mm. So what what happened in 1969 after you left us? Well, like, after this idyllic four year period, when I could see that it was coming to an end, um, there was a, a certain kind of crisis. Um, and so to put it on hold seemed a perfectly logical thing to do while I developed other aspects. And so I fell in with this uh, community of Anglican Franciscan friars who were very much non-conformists. Um, and um, at the end of my fourth year in art school, I went to the brother in charge and said, I would very much like to come and um, test my vocation. And he asked me whether I had a wife and I said no, and he asked me whether I had debts, and I said no. And he said I was welcome to come in, in January, uh, which I did. But then there's another shift where mm. you become interested in uh, the Russian Orthodox mm. tradition. The brothers had built a brand new chapel, octagonal. In Brisbane? They asked me to paint an altarpiece five-panelled altarpiece and in two weeks I knocked one up. On timber panels? Um, masonite uh, prepared with canvas over the masonite mm -hmm. and um, they loved it. It was like a theatre set. It, mm -hmm. it didn't have a permanence. It was a bit of an embarrassment but nonetheless I did it. So this world opens up and then you become baptised into the Russian yes, Orthodox? I, I left the friary um, I didn't become Russian Orthodox straight away. It took me some courage to ask that question. I hadn't, like, Bishop Constantine um, alerted to me to what I needed to be doing. He left you with some books, yeah. Yeah, but also he asked me to paint two icons for him. He asked me to paint the Bozhoi uh, Mate Vladimirskaya, the mother of God of Vladimir, which... Uh, is the preeminent of all Russian icons. He asked me to paint an icon of St. Nicholas, just head and shoulders. He made me, he alerted me to things like the use of bow, laying uh, French rouge underneath my gilding, things I didn't know about, um, uh, fine tuning. Um, but up until this stage, I hadn't used egg tempera. And the thing about icon painting, um, traditionally, it's egg tempera, which is the preferred medium, which is a more, it, 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 uh, oil painting has a certain kind of sensuality, whereas the medium of egg tempera um, has a, a kind of hieratic, priestly kind of um, severity. Maybe, Leonard, we could talk a little bit more about your more recent works in which you've returned to the brush. Mm. I had to modify the way I worked because my spine protested. And so I began a whole new body of work um, where the application of paint was done with the brush um, and so the exhibition that came out of this body of work was called Old Fashioned Painting. But when I was in first year art school, I can remember Roy Churcher saying, oh, there's talk on the grapevine that painting is dead. This was in 1965, and I thought, well, you know. Um, with uh, passing decades, you hear to a greater or lesser degree the same thing being said. Um, but my great love is painting. It is one of the very few things that we have always done and that we are still doing. Uh, it is one of the few areas of cultural continuity. There are not many things that you can say that about.
Well, that's, that's given us something to carry on with. Um, it's a fantastic interview. And it, <coughs> it was great that I had a chance to talk with Leonard earlier on in the week because Angela's interview is in 2015, is that correct? I thought it was 17. 17, oh, excuse me. 17. No, I don't know. It's sort of, you know, yeah. give or argy bargy. Give, give or take. And, and, and we have a chance now to think about what was said, but also bring things up to date a little bit. But some of the people that I think we wanted to talk about have already been brought up, and I want to go back to that Miss Cameron, Betty Cameron, better known as Betty Churcher. And I want to know if we can go back to the Central School and if I can ask you in a bit, bit more fine grain what it was like and more particularly how does learning happen in a context like that? Initially, my mother took me down to the art school and I had an interview with Cyril Gibbs, the principal. And I was put into Mrs. Bryan's class. Hmm. She was a matriarch from Baden. And every morning, she, Saturday morning when she came in, she brought some of the rusticity of Baden with her. One morning she came in and said, Giorgio Morandi painted bottles all his life. This morning we're going to paint bottles. And after this year with Mrs. Bryan, she came to me and she said, Laddie, I'm going to hand you over to Miss Cameron. Mm -hmm. She's just returned from the Royal College and I think you'll do well with her. Mm. It was an unknown, but as soon as ever I laid eyes on Miss Cameron, uh, there was connection. I think, uh, as a young boy, I think I fell in love with her. Um, she never patronized. She gave you skills that were skills that were to last forever. And so I learnt opaque and transparent oil glazing from Miss Cameron. And over the period of time on these Saturday mornings, I would come home and I would take the scissors, take a pair of scissors and uh, extract Miss Cameron's illustrations. She was a great demonstrator. And I built up quite a collection. And there were times when Betty was away uh, giving birth. And Roy would step in. And I would similarly take the scissors out and remove. And I built up a collection. But I went looking for the collection one day and it was nowhere to be found. Um, my mother realized that there was another woman in my life. <laughs> uh, but yes, it was a, a memorable time, pre-arts, pre-full-time art school. Um, it was like being in a regional preparatory school before the serious business began. Now, the gallery used to do Saturday morning classes for young people for decades and decades. That was with Vida Lay. Vida Lay, but these were at the Central School. This was at the Central School. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so, yes, there was this... Uh, and I would come in with all kinds of harebrained schemes. I, I'd come across uh, an image of a Byzantine Pantocrata from the 12th century, from... Uh, Kefalu in Cyprus, in uh, Sicily. In Sicily. And, um, and so that week I went out and purchased Tesere and, and I arrived with a board and a hammer and chisel. Actually, they're Norman. That's from the cathedral. Well, the artists were Byzantine. Yes, that's true. And so, um, which was a, you know, a bit of a continu historical continuum um, mm. of uh, if you wanted something well done, you got Greeks to do sure. the job. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, as was the custom in ancient Rome, if you wanted a doctor, it was always a it's Greek, a Greek doctor. doctor. And it was a, you know, something, something that mm. was in the Learning. Air. Learning. Yeah. And uh, you went to mm. where you got the goods. 
Can I just take a step back? Yeah. Who had the idea of sending you to these Saturday morning classes? Did you pester your mum? Or who had the bright idea? Let's uh, go back a bit. Look, this is like a, a galaxy far, far away. But, yes. But uh, I was always in my primary school. Um, there was Barbara Dawson, who later became the Labour uh, representative for Merthyr. Mm -hmm. And she was the ducks of the class. And I sat close to the blackboard because I wore glasses. And so we were polarities apart. But um, my friends always gave me the vote as being the artist of the class. <laughs> and so that's where it started. Um, you didn't get into trouble for scribbling in class all the time? Uh, no. No. Uh, but there was this acknowledgement and it was something uh, I um, very early um, uh, the nuns at school I was at the Holy Spirit school in New Farm and the nuns asked to see my mother requesting that uh, they have a meeting because I they were worried that I was blind and so um, my mother finally had the confrontation and um, and I was taken off to an eye specialist. And, um, and that afternoon, I was admitted to hospital. Uh, the eye specialist, in looking at my eye, noticed a pencil mark on my cheek. And it was a malignant melanoma. And so had not the eye specialist been looking intently at my eye... Um, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today. Uh, and the eye specialist said to my mother, well, does he like reading? And my mother said, no, not particularly. Um, and, uh, and then the eye specialist said, well, does he like drawing? And she said, oh, yes, he loves drawing. And so the eye specialist said, encourage him. And so with the authority of, <laughs> of a doctor, I was encouraged. And uh, there was no looking back. Um, and so uh, it became, my parents became aware that there were these Saturday morning classes at the Central Technical College, and, uh, and that's where it began. Um, but I had the unfortunate um, experience of being in a secondary school uh, where my mode of survival was to play truant. Hmm. Um, and so I became a master of truancy. Hmm. Um, three months initially, and then I was sent back, and then another two months. And my, my parents were pulling their hair out, and, um, and there was a meeting with Cyril Gibbs, the principal of the art school, and they bent the rules, because I entered art school at the age of 14 and a half, um, without matriculation, um, and so they bent the rules and made an exception for me. So I started very young, um, and... Yes, go on. And post-art school, in um, going to study theology for four years, my education, I caught up with my education. I think you've answered my, the last part of my question, which was how does learning happen? <laughs> the answer is if a person wants to learn, then they will. Hmm. Hmm. I'm tempted to, but I daren't ask you where you went for three months. Short I, answer? I, my, my parents ran a shop in Stafford, and so they left early, and I was left home until they returned home. And so I was ostensibly doing Betty Church, Betty, Miss Cameron's artwork for Saturday morning. <laughs> um, that's what kept me busy. Okay. As well as watching Maggie Tabber on Beauty Maggie. and the Beast. <laughs> well, that's an education in itself, surely. Yes, yeah, socialisation. That's it. You mentioned, we mentioned Bishop Constantine before, and so we, I'm trying to kind of, it's, this is completely fascinating. This is like the social history of Brisbane, you know, but in finer grain. And so I'm trying to get you to spit out as much as you can remember, but... You, you did have a very particular kind of training up to a certain point, and that was covered in the very well in the um, wonderful interview with Angela Goddard. But I'm going to ask you how you learned, how you, how you came to learn, what you learned from Bishop Constantine. And I'm thinking of something 
you said to me the other day when we were talking about the Blake Prize, you said something about a Byzantine way of knowing. And I wondered mm. if you can explore that for us, because this connects to the idea about how one learns or why one learns. So I'm an odd fellow. Um, from a very early age, I was aware of something outside of the Western construct. It wasn't always easy to access because, in a way, the suprematist culture of the West had blocked up access to the East. Uh, threatening investment is never thanked. And so the whole birth of the modern age in the second millennia was ostensibly a rewriting of the How to, ha how to Drive It handbook. <laughs> and out of that came naturalism and an investment in empirical knowing. Hmm. Um, but that empirical knowing was centred on the idea of offering proof. The first millennia, which is the millennia that pertains to the great age of early Christian and Byzantine culture, which I wholeheartedly identify with, um, the Byzantines weren't concerned with offering proof. And so their choices were those that they never embraced the need to offer proof. They never embraced the need to pursue naturalism because there was no need to offer proof of something they already knew deeply. And so they chose a certain kind of abstraction. And it's that that permeates uh, Byzantine thought um, to make a, a kind of comparison between the two East and West, Western modes um, within a Western perception of the anal analysis of physical space you have a one point perspective mm -hmm. from which lines move into infinity uh, connecting and becoming measurable in their intersections. Within, not all, but within grand Byzantine icons, there is an eight-point perspective, not one, and the lines don't meet in, in, in infinity, but grow ever wider apart. And so another kind of comparison the Western view of the end of all things is what's called the beatific vision, which comes over loud and strong in the paintings of people like Fra Angelica, where you sit back in the grandstand and look on God. The Byzantine view is that you become God. Very different, participant and observer. Uh, and so there is a very marked distinction. And so to talk about Byzantine thought um, is tricky because within our Western culture there are very few references or it's perceived to be some kind of exotic form of Roman Catholicism, which it's not. Hmm. Um, and so all of this has been profoundly informative in my choices and the way in which I know, and the way in which I see the world. Um, and this is not just when you're painting in the, in the Byzantine No, it manner. carries over. It carries over to the kinds of paintings and that so have been shown. And so in the, in the yeah. same sense, you know, the great contribution to Western modernism in the early 20th century of course. were the Russian constructivists who brought with them uh, a view of abstraction hmm. which was foreign to Western idioms mm -hmm. uh, because they also 
were schooled in these Byzantine ways of knowing. The forms already were, were already um, in existence, as it were, mm. and had to be manifested rather than forms in the world described. Mm. Yes, okay. It was some, it, like to, to, I don't know, to, to, uh, it's a way of knowing. A way of knowing. And, uh, and that wasn't about, uh, and so, you know, on a, a more sort of ecclesial kind of level, uh, one could say that the authenticity of what was imparted sacramentally was complete in itself. Hmm. So with baptism and chrismation, you were given the Holy Spirit. Um, and the authenticity of these sacraments gave you a knowledge uh, that is uncircumscribable. It's very hard to get one's head around it when one's been brought up in another tradition. Yes, but well, I'm, I'm, that's what I said. I'm a funny fellow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got you, funny fellow, Tom, mm. you know, through the 60s and 70s with two different educations, two different ways of knowing, mm. right? And presumably you did learn through Miss Cameron and Mr. Churcher and Mrs. Churcher about how to render things and how to oh, draw things. Uh, uh, but, but, but also, four years of academic... My, my art school course uh, was, a, it was like the la I was the last to go through the art school in uh, the old academic mode. Um, for the first year, we weren't allowed to use colour. Ah. For the first year, we studied skeletal anatomy. My year missed out on going to the morgue. How did, how did that happen? Well, they, somehow, it, you know, it dropped off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and I thought, well, you know, it's okay. Um, uh, but that's, that was the nature of my course. Two, three-hour lectures a day, five days a week. Um, and... Um, Drawing in black and white. For the first year, in black and white. Only drawing? Painting in black and white. Okay. Uh, monochrome. And then third year, second year, colour. In uh, second year, the life class. Ooh. Um, the first year, from the cast. Yeah. And I remember my mother and my next-door neighbour standing on my next-door neighbour's balcony one afternoon, and my job on a Friday afternoon was to mow the lawn with the victor. And... Um, they were having a conference, and it, it dawned on my mother that I was doing the life class. <laughs> I see, right here. And, um, but so Dr. Langer called your nudes unerotic to, say, to save your reputation? I don't know. I, I think she was... Uh, yes, they were unerotic. Uh, there was an image that came up, which was a much later painting of a, a, um, a la prima male mm. nude. Mm. That was... 1984. So there was a bit of a mix in the continuity there. Mm -hmm. But these nudes were... Um, I sold one to a, uh, a collector, and years later I was invited to her house at, on the river at East Brisbane. And I looked at the painting and I thought, that's not the way I left it. <laughs> <laughs> Had it been... Improved. It had been tampered with, oh. with chalk. <laughs> <laughs> to cover up... Uh, pubic hair. Oh, I was going to say rude bits, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and so I... Uh, but there was a Norman Lindsay hanging beside it, and there'd been a, uh, a crocheted G-string to go with the Norman Lindsay. <laughs> I think this is fantastic, you know. <laughs> and <was> so, <laughs> so it's all, you know, part and parcel of... You know, walking into rooms that you'd not been in before and, um, and also reviewing where you'd been, the evidence of your activity and uh, the way in which... It's not always the, the way in which you've left it. I, I was going to ask the next question about the differences in cultural context <laughs> in the city between when you first showed and when you... Your last, most recent show at Jan Murphy Gallery was only in November, right? And the, the show's got a wonderful title. It's called Zoographis, Zoographis Life Writer. So I was going to ask about the differences in the, in the cultural context, but I think you've kind of sketched some of them already. Um, it, so it was, a, it was a much more prudish town. 
How, how, would, how did it work, I mean, for people who are interested in art? And this is before the Queensland Art Gallery opened on South Bank, as when mm. it was still at the museum, or sometimes it was well, actually in the, in the MIM in building. In the Queensland Art Gallery hobble between one temporary premises and another. Mm. Um, but then, simultaneously, you had the Johnson Gallery mm. that pioneered the Australian moderns. Mm. Uh, the Benython Gallery in Adelaide and the Johnson in Brisbane were out in the front. And so as an art student, that's what you did on Saturday afternoon. Um, you went to the Johnson Gallery. Mm. Um, and... I hung out with the Johnsons. They were always charming. They knew I didn't have a cash book, a checkbook, um, and uh, they were always uh, gracious and wonderful. And, um, but at the same time, there was an exhibition of John Mulvig uh, at the Grand Central Gallery. Uh -huh. um, where Philip Bacon started his career. Yes, that's where I first met Philip Bacon, when he was mm -hmm. 20. Mm -hmm. Um, He's but, still 20, I think. But there was a complaint from the, a member of the public who'd visited the exhibition that um, there was a painting that made them feel uneasy. This is your exhibition? No, this is the... Mulvig. Mulvig oh. exhibition. And so the exhibition was visited by the Vice Squad. Hmm. And the, the painting... The, 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 the exhibition was closed down. And so I was maybe a second-year art student at this time, and so, but it's, you know, it's what you did in your lunch hour from art school, to mm. go hopping around mm -hmm. the Grand Central Gallery upstairs. Mm. You know, there was mm. sort, of, sort of a lot of motel art in their downstairs uh, business, but upstairs there was a larger gallery mm. space. But this exhibition was closed down, but the painting is currently in the Queensland Art Gallery, and it's called The Twilight of Women. Oh, yes. Um, but that was the painting that made um, this um, person from Hamilton feel uneasy. I don't think I knew this story. Did anybody else know this? Chris or Angela? This is fantastic. It is a, it is a disturbing painting. It's, it's, it's full of... I mean, the Vice Squad, excuse me? It's, it's, it's urgent, it's passionately painted. There's a kind of tangle of people. There, were, I mean? other, there were other paintings in the exhibition that made you know, that had the potential for ill eases also. Um, I think Mulvig would have been... Perhaps he was... To, perhaps he was really pleased. Well, I think there was a kind of... You know, as an art student, um, I, I grew up in a time where we asked questions and non-conformity uh, was in the air. It was a badge of honour. We were, we were, we prided ourselves on non-conformity. Mm. Uh, they were the times. That was my generation. Mm. Mm. Um, and while, you know, I never went because I, you know, like the drinking age was 21 and, and uh, I knew about the parties up on Petrie Terrace at Mulvig Studio, but I, you know, and I, 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 I was under age and, you know, and... As it was, I was sneaking out and doing clandestine things under my parents' nose. And so, you know, I was... You know, my, my mother would say to me, anyone who's out after midnight, Leonard, is up to no good. And I, I wondered how she knew. But... <laughs> because we never know what our parents have been up to in the uh, past, that's why. But it was like a time of growing up and trying to be fluid, mm. but also being very pious. Mm. Because uh, when so I... It's a bad mix. When I was 16, uh, 15, in, well, early... 15 and a half, at the beginning of... Uh, 1966, I approached the local Anglican rector in Newfound and told him I didn't believe in the Immaculate Conception and I didn't believe in papal claims, and he said, welcome aboard. <laughs> and, and so, so I, I fell under the tutelage of a, um, a doctor of theology, but there was a, an assistant priest who was professor of chemistry at UQ, um, but you didn't go out at night with these chaps, right? No, no, no. no. But, you know, but I, 
Like during the four years, for the last three years of my art school, I served mass every morning at seven o'clock. Oh, this is the mixture of piety and nonconformity. I yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, both ends. I mean, being out after midnight and and being at mass at seven o'clock, you are a busy man. I had energy. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to I'm going to move on because we've got. I'm looking at Troy and I'm looking at the clock. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I've got two more questions, and so um, this one can be a short, a short, a short answer. What's a typical day in the studio, and is there a typical day? Right, let's come right back to the present. Let's mm. come to this year. Mm. I'm a funny fellow. <laughs> and so um, I don't have a nine-to-five job. Um, it can be that I paint the icon seasonally. Because of humidity. Because of sweating. Ah. And the medium being water soluble. Oh dear. And so this season that has now come upon us is uh, ideal for icon painting. Okay. Uh, and so contemporary painting, um, but oh, in recent years I've just thrown it all up in the air and I find myself interchanging. Uh, this year there's only been, there have only been two paintings. Um, one diminutive painting, and one 120 by 120. Because I spent six months, uh, six weeks in Greece prior to Christmas, and during that time I stayed on the Holy Mountain Athos for four days, and so I needed to memorialise that experience in a painting, which is something I've always done. The big one or the little one? The big one. Mm -hmm. And so the big one is called uh, A Boy Lifted to Heaven and Heard the Trisagion. What's the Trisagion? The Trisagion is this great prayer. After, in 449, there was a great earthquake in Constantinople, and a boy was lifted to heaven and heard the prayer, the Trisagion. Hagios otheros, hagios ischios, hagios othenatos, iles animas. And the Empress Pulcharia told the patriarch that this has to be incorporated in the liturgy for all time. And it's one of those curious prayers. So in the the, the Western Rite, very few vestiges of Greek custom remain in the Western Rite. The Kyrie eleison. Yes. But on Good Friday in the Western Rite, the Trisagion. No way. Which is this peculiar memory from when the East and West were in harmony. Um, and so this painting uh, corresponds to being lifted to heaven and hearing the Trisagion. The last question, of course, because Leonard knew the script, <laughs> was about the travels, and I, I envy him, and I will have to always envy him being on the Holy Mountain, because, as you know, women may not go on to the Holy Mountain, but you were able to spend some time there. And, in fact, I think you have to be ordained to go on to the Holy Mountain. No, you have to present a baptismal certificate, uh, which me and my, myself and my mentee were able to do. And you stayed there. We stayed there. We stayed in three monasteries, which is all you can manage in a four-day permit. Mm -hmm. The previous time I had to present a permit to visit anywhere was staying with the great indigenous curator, Diane Moon, mm -hmm. at Manangrida. Mm -hmm. um, we had to have a permit to be of course, there. Of course. And so there was a per we had a permit, and... Um, because you, uh, the distance between each monastery was a, an equivalent of a day's walk, we could only stay in three um, over the four days. That's why you went on a jeep, not on a donkey. Well, we got a, a jeep. We, we started a five-hour hike between monasteries, and if we'd still been walking, we wouldn't have got there till midnight. With the but a monk came past in a four-wheel drive, a jeep, and... Um, <laughs> We couldn't resist getting on. I think it's the only sane thing to do. And, uh, and it was uh, the monastery of Gurguriu, which overlooks the Mediterranean. How divine. And so we arrived just to see the sunset over the Mediterranean. But if we'd been walking without the uh, hitching a lift, uh, we would have still been going. I started by talking to you about, about learning and... I guess you were still learning, though enjoying yourself. You're still learning when you went to Mount Athos, and I and I remember, of course, that you did. You've actually studied with the Australian um, Institute of Archaeology in Athens. So, the, the 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 trip to Greece, the last trip to Greece, and the and the time you spent 
Is there something in particular that you've brought back just for the last minute or so before we have to wrap up? Mm. Something that, that you brought back in your, with your memory that, well, the boy lifted up to heaven, I suppose. Well, it's, it's, it's uncontainable. Um, it's, these experiences are not about domesticating something or bringing something home and okay. domesticating it. Okay. You ha it's it's uh, remaining forever f free and undomesticated. Um, but this was the fourth time I'd been in Greece, mm. and my first time was to study with the Australian Institute of Archaeology. Mm. And uh, on returning home, I had to instruct my accountant that um, these journeys are... I, I must claim them. <laughs> because without these journeys, I remain impoverished. And so uh, it is in Greece that I feel most at home. Mm. And I, I, it doesn't sound very nationalistic of me, but the well that I draw my water from is there. And, um, and so... Um, one of my favourite, it's not a saying, but it's a, an account of a, a desert father's activity, uh, Abba Karamon, and it's said of him that he lived 40 miles from the church and 10 miles from the marsh and the water supply. So when he took to his cave, he took two goatskin bottles of water and he sat there leading a quiet life. And so the ratio of 40 miles from the church and 10 miles from the water supply is something that I steer by. <laughs> uh, and so over a lifetime, I've become uh, very self-sufficient. Mm. Uh, ecclesiology gives me a bit of a sore head, uh, but I'm not the first one to have a sore head from ecclesiology. And so... The way I do things is the way I do things, um, and it's slightly unconventional, um, but... Um, I hope your accountant sees your argument, <laughs> and you can go back. Leonard, thank you. My joy. We've come to the end of our time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we can hop back up. Oh, now we've, got the, now we've got the questions. Now let's see if I can work out... We have some questions that have come in from the audience in this, with this splendid device. And um, the, the first one is, is really interesting, and Leonard and I can both read them very well. Although icon paintings typically appear two-dimensional, they have a particular depth of presence. Do you experience these icons as living in some way? Um. The materials that are used in the process are all emblems of the natural world. There are no synthetics. They are all emblems of the natural world, the wood, the egg, the pigment. And so the, th the thinking, the understanding of what you're engaged in is a restoration of matter to the divine image. Hmm. And so... Um, it's in sort of Milton-esque language. It's a restoration of paradise. Okay. So, yes, living. It's, it's, a, it's a life of the spirit more than matter, isn't it? It's a restoration of matter. It's a restoration of matter. This is hard. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Simon Farley has asked about the importance of Arthur Creedy. Mm. Now, who is Arthur Creedy? The f he inaugurated the first government department of cultural activities in this country. Ah. During the Second World War, he was at Bletchley Park. Ah. He was a, an English professor from Cambridge. And uh, he inaugurated the Office of Cultural Activities in Queensland in 1970. The first thing he did was establish a library as part of the department. So when you went to see the Director of Cultural Activities, oh, you I quite often I came away with a book that had nothing to do with your subject. <laughs> um, but also, he 
married uh, one of my great mentors, the sculptress Betty Church's contemporary from Somerville House. He married Mary Creedy, um, and um, and so there was a very close friendship. Um, they arrived at my country cottage unannounced because I didn't have a telephone, and um, they stayed for two weeks. Um, but in the evening, Arthur would read the poets and introduce Jared Manley Hopkins in the meter in which one read Hopkins. And so my education in English literature was extended. What I missed out on by being truant, um, <laughs> I made up for in a more fulsome way with Arthur Creedy. Um, mm. He, uh, a significant mentor. We've got fantastic questions here and not enough time, and I'm going to elevate one of them that I think follows on. Um, the one that's in the, the very large writing, who's been your favourite teacher, either artistic or religious? Oh. And it could be someone like oh. Arthur, you see. I mean, see, like, well, I, person you know, from whom you have learned. Yes, I don't know. Like, that's uh, favouritism. Is, um, no, no, no. Someone uh, who comes top of mind for him. I don't know. Even the Lord had his favourites, you know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, St. John. St. John. Uh, and so, I don't know, but I, I would have to say, as my spiritual father, uh, the Constantine mm. Bishop of Brisbane, mm. uh, Boston and Richmond, mm. who lay in the grave for 18 years in Texas, and when his body was exhumed, uh, he was lying in the grave as fresh as the day they had put him in. And so I painted the first icon of him, um, uh, and so I would have to say, uh, Bishop Constantine. the Holy Bishop Constantine. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the question that's got the most ticks on the other hand, which is the little thumbs up, is Angela's question about the poetic titles of what she calls your contemporary works, which I think you've sometimes called old fashioned painting. Mm. So can you talk about the relationship of the image or the painting to text in your work? It's a bit of a cop out to say untitled. Okay. I see. Right. Yes. And and. And so. Um, I've got a Blake Prize title here, for, just to, just for example, the Blake Prize one, and this goes to knowing because I'm going to put you on the spot here. The Blake Prize title was "If you put your ear close, you'll hear it breathing." The painting. What breathing? What is breathing? But this, and, and if you put your ear close, isn't this about proof of a sort? No, it's the resident property within the painting to be evocative. Ah. And so, uh, and that it can be many things, because I'm one of the philosophic uh, branches, one of the distinctions between. Western thought and Eastern thought. Uh, in the second millennia, the West backed Aristotelianism, mm -hmm. uh, absol yes. absolutes, mm. whereas the Gospels and the whole uh, ecclesial writing of the first millennia is according to Neoplatonic thought. And so uh, you don't need an earthly representative of Christ on earth, because Christ is the head of the church. Mm -hmm. But within an Aristotelian view of the world, you need... The, the, the key word is participation. Mm. So within Platonism, you have this participation between spiritual and earthly realities. Mm -hmm. In Aristotelianism, uh, you just have absolutes. And so it's not just a painting. It participates in something beyond it. And so it pulls evocatively those references into its materiality. Does that mean that when you title a painting in the way that Angela's asked about, it's something you were thinking about that day? or No, something? it's something you'd live. The poetry is your life force. You, okay. live, you live the poetry. Are some of the titles quotes from poems? Some, and some are mine. And which poems? Which poems? Oh, I'm a great fan of the Greek poet... 
Red sauce. Okay. Elitus and Sepphoris. Okay. Um, Kafafi. Uh, of course. Uh, but, um, but then some of them are ancient, from ancient sources. But then many of them are mine, because I write poetry as well. This is great. I didn't know this. This is fantastic. Thank you. Okay, this is something else we've got on the record. Um, a couple of quick questions before we, we're going to be bundled out of here. Mm. Yes, how long have we got, Troy? Four minutes, thank you. The critical, what were the critical, let's go back to the, 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 the um, which is the right question here? Um, it's that the bottom one's interesting. Are there, uh, is there room for contemporary personalities to be painted in the Byzantine way or the the person said tradition or style. Is there, can contemporary people be painted like that? You've already answered that question, haven't you? Because you painted Bishop Constantine. Yes, but that was because I realised that he was righteous. And within canon, the, in the East, the canonization of a, a saint begins from the ground up, not from the top down. Okay. So a person is canonised by those who knew them. Okay. And so when I heard that his body was incorrupt after being in the grave for 18 years, I painted an icon of him. But while I was in Athens at the Galandaris Foundation, there was a... Uh, this time? This time. There was a massive exhibition of the painter Fotis Kontoglu and his influence on his contemporary contemporaries. Uh, and so Kontoglu in the 1930s began a revival of Byzantine painting within Greece as opposed to pursuing romantic aspirations, but also a lot of the younger painters in Greece in the 1930s were looking to the School of Paris. Yes, of course. Uh, but Contoglu turned that right around and said, you know, we are Greeks, we are Byzantines, uh, we have uh, the idiom within... Uh, it's in front of us. So, in short, it has been done, and it has been and done for at least... Yes, and so, and years. currently, because I, I, I my mentee, I painted a... Uh, a portrait according to the proportions of Dobell Cypriot. I painted a homage to the mm. Dobell Cypriot in 2019 or 2020. Yeah, it was a fantastic picture. And so, um, and so I painted that, and um, because it was like a, a painting that was very important to me from a, the age of 14. Mm. Um, and um, but I've come home after seeing the Kontoglu exhibition in Athens. And I've begun an egg tempera uh, on a small panel of my mentee mm. um, painted in the Byzantine manner, not with oil paint, but, with, but not following the idioms of academic painting, but following the idioms of Byzantine painting. And it's Kintoglu painted iconesque works of his wife and children. Uh, and I said to my mentee on the phone the other night, I said, well, you know, Chris, there's no gold. I'm mm. not using any, I can't use any gold because uh, sequentially in the development of something, you get to a point where you lay the gold. Mm. But I'm just painting a contemporary okay. uh, Byzantine image of a, a contemporary man. So this is the first one? This, is the, this is the first time mm -hmm. I've, I've done this. Yeah, okay. it's, it's only tiny, okay. but it's got me back into the studio because I went into a kind of very rough re-entry hmm. after um, being on Holy Mountain. One does. One does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are two more questions. I um, think we can deal with them quite quickly. The, the bottom one, how long does it take to paint abstract, the, that is to say old-fashioned painting versus icons, which takes a long time? This is a very basic studio Well, question. I was talking in my um, Brisbane art dealer's gallery I was speaking to some clients and my art dealer was sitting at her desk within earshot <laughs> and um, the clients were asking certain questions and I said well yes it's uh, 14,500 and I said you're not buying the icon you're buying my labour because this icon took three and a half months to paint. Okay. So... They're very labour-intensive. They're very labour-intensive, and I work in a certain manner where there are three distinctive layers in the development of the image. Okay. So that's the short answer. 
The long answer is... <laughs> <laughs> we have one final question. Yeah. Which, goes, which, which Because the person has asked it, and, you know, let's just deal with it. What were the critical... Were there, what were the critical issues in your transition from the Anglican tradition to the Orthodox? Mm. Were there... Any Moving from east to west. Mm. Um, and because it wasn't made easy... But west, I grew up west to I, east from west to east, mm. but I grew up in a time where people like T. S. Eliot, who was the chairman of the board of Faber and Faber, that's right, um, made the recommendation to the board that they publish the five volumes of the Greek Philokalia, um, the love of the good, great Byzantine uh, spiritual writing. And the members of the board looked at Eliot and thought he was crazy. Um, but he said, if we don't do this, uh, the West will be impoverished. So they, they belligerently published two volumes with selections out of the five. It went into reprint, 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 Faber and Faber. And so there was this period in the post-war where there were people looking east. Uh, the Anglican Church, in its history, always kept the corridors of conversation open between itself and Russia, um, not so with continental Catholic Europe. And so at the court of Queen Elizabeth I, there was always an ambassador... Now, to that's going too far back. <laughs> at the court of Elizabeth I, there was always an ambassador to Russia. Sure. And, um, and, so the, and there was even a society in London called the Society of St Alban and Sergius that promoted conversation between the Anglican Church and the Orthodox Church. So, in fact, it wasn't that hard. And my, my mentors in... She said firmly. My, my, my mentors in New Farm, um, Father Peacock, who was the professor of chemistry, um, I was present at his funeral, which was... Uh, officiated by a Greek Orthodox bishop yeah. and five Orthodox priests, mm. Father Peacock had become Greek Orthodox. And so his daughter had contacted me on the phone and asked for anecdotes about her father. Uh, and the young bishop who presided at my teacher's funeral, uh, he was one of my lecturers in doctrine at the friary because we brought professors in. So there's been, two, there's been all this dialogue all this oh, time. Oh, it's complex. Yeah. And... Uh, it's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> on that note, I, um, thank you. We, we've got the wind up from Troy's very firm. And I haven't even had a, a, a sip of water. No, I know you haven't. Well, you're not going to get one. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, I'm Gavin Bannerman from State Library Queensland, and I'm here to... It's, it's so cerebral, I feel like running a raffle is just kind of, <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, I am here to wrap up um, today's proceed tonight's proceedings, and, and no, I'm actually going to run a raffle. Um, <laughs> So, um, thank you for everybody for coming and your participation and your questions and the rich conversation tonight. Um, my mind's whirring with all the possibilities and I think um, it's sort of a, a 21st century way of being, you know, I was just sitting in the audience and thinking, you know, those people who would sit in the reading room for hours poring over books, the amount of knowledge and information we've acquired in an hour is probably a week's worth of reading. So thank you for being so generous with your stories. Um, I'm just going to... I, I sometimes, like, cast an offsider to kind of pick, pick something out, but I'm just going to do it myself to the interest of um, brevity. Can I get a drum... We don't have a drum roll soundtrack or anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. I'll go to the... Get the real, I'll get the really, really scrunched up one. Okay, and so I, sh I should say that... Have we got the book, Troy? Sure, okay, we're good for it. Um, so the winner... 
<laughs> the, the, the winner of um, the raffle will take home a copy of the Meet the Artist book, which Julie um, has wrote, um, uh, has written um, the, the lead text for. Uh, it also includes photography. Some of you've seen some of the photography from Joe Ruckley um, and other photographers featured um, throughout uh, the presentation today. So it's an amazing. A permanent record, really, of the exhibition, which is on level two here at State Library. Um, I'm just going to pad for time while Troy gets a copy of a book, <laughs> because I, I, I don't want to. I don't want somebody to leave empty-handed. Um, the copies are still for sale as well, if you're un, unlucky and not able to to be the winner. Um, so, okay, so the winner, the winner for tonight is Red B20. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> One of the people furthest away in the crowd. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll leave it here. No, that's not going to work. Um, okay. So, um, thank you. I've just got a few little um, pieces of information and things to promote. Um, just a note. Um, tonight's session um, has been recorded. We don't live stream them because we want it to be of the moment. But um, a recording of this will be available in the coming weeks on State Library's website. So if you have friends or family or contacts who couldn't make it tonight, we will be um, sharing that through the channels, um, the usual channels soon. Uh, the Meet the Artist exhibition is open until the 9th of July here at State Library Queensland on the second level, just around the corner at S in SLQ Gallery. So please encourage friends, family to um, explore that uh, physical representation of the James C. Suris uh, collection of artists' interviews. I'd also like to promote an upcoming curator's tour that Julie is giving tomorrow um, of the exhibition. So tomorrow from 12 p.m. you're able to come along and hear firsthand Julie's, um, Julie talk to the works and the stories within the exhibition in level two. So um, you can book that or you know come along at 12 o'clock and we'll see you see you there for part two. And also we have an accompanying display in the Australian Library of Art Showcase, which is in level four of State Library of Queensland, which features um, artist books and rare books and other creations from artists that are featured in the, um, in the Meet the Artist exhibition. That's on level four. And we have a series of monthly curators tours of both, both spaces. So please um, check our event listings and hopefully have a first-hand experience with um, these incredible works. Um, there is a pop-up shop outside, so if you do want your own, you know, copy to take home, Julie's signing copies, I'll dob her in for that. <laughs> um, we're also doing, uh, you might get an, one of those annoying emails, I know I just went to the dentist yesterday and it was like, how was your experience at this dentist? <laughs> It was fine. I was out quickly and it was painless. But um, we, we will be sending you a survey in the coming days. It, it is um, genuinely uh, important for us to, to ask you uh, how you found these, um, these nights, anything that you would like to find out more or less about in the um, construction of the, of the uh, proceedings. So if there's anything that you're interested in the future, please um, let us know through that, through that survey. Um, but finally, I'd like to... Um, Thank you, everybody, for participating in tonight. I'd like to particularly thank Julie and Leonard again for the wonderful conversation. I'd like to thank Angela for her wonderful interview with uh, Leonard all those years ago. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to thank James and um, Marika for making this whole series possible. Thank you. So please, thank you. Have a good night. And we'll see you for the next um, pr uh, presentation, which will be um, coming up later in the year. Thank you very much. Goodbye.